Well, I'm going to go ahead and get us started today. Everyone, thank you so much for coming to this month's Interest from an Actuary, where we're, we are talking to some of our folks from our affinity identity-based organizations. I am super excited to have Jesse and David here from NAWA and IABA, respectively. And I always forget what the acronyms stand for because there are so many acronyms in the actuarial world that I'm going to turn it over to them and let them explain what they're here talking about today. Thank you so much. I can kick off the introductions. My name is Jesse. I'm a consulting actuary with Milliman. And I'm here representing NAWA, um, which stands for the Network of Actuarial Women and Allies. Our mission and our purpose is to um, increase um, the women that are in the actuarial profession and support all women through their entire actuarial journey. Um, so we offer a lot of uh, networking events, um, support each other through professional development events, and then we are doing research on barriers to entry for um, women across across the actuarial profession. Uh, so very excited to be here and looking forward to this webinar. Thanks, Jesse. Hi, everyone. My name is David Gede. I'm also a health actuary with uh, Deloitte Consulting, and I'm here representing the IABA, which stands for the International Association of Black Actuaries. Um, and the mission of the association is really to increase the number of successful Black actuaries in the field and also raising awareness about the actual field. Um, so this uh, association is there to support uh, minority groups, uh, especially Black, um, that don't have uh, the knowledge about the actual profession. Um, and again, I'm also excited to be here um, and looking forward to the conversation. So. Sometimes I lose my uh, my unmute button. Thank you both so much for those introductions. I'm going to go ahead and drop two attachments into the chat. And let's see, those should both be there. And those are our one pagers on uh, both IABA and NAWA. And I realize I forgot to mention that we have a QA and a box on the bottom of your screen. That's how we'll be taking questions today. So please go ahead and feel free to put questions in there. You have two actuaries here, so you don't only have to ask about, um, you know, these two great organizations that they're here to talk about, but any questions that y'all might have at all. Um, so if y'all wouldn't mind, I'm getting some Teams pings over here, so I think I have to go sort something out really fast on the side. But if y'all just want to talk a little bit about, you know, the conferences that that your organizations holds just a little bit of what the work that you do in the community and in the actuarial community, that would be super helpful. Sure. You want to take it on, Jesse, or? Um, sure, I can start. Um, so we, um, as I mentioned, primarily focus on networking events and professional development events at the moment. Um, really our goal is to get um, women together. Um, so we'll host happy hours, we'll do um, virtual networking events, um, and then every year we'll do a big annual meeting to get everyone in our organization together. On top of that, we facilitate a lot of networking and professional development through our volunteer program. So we have a couple dozen volunteers that support everything we do at NAWA. Um, and this really gives a lot of um, women and and allies opportunities to step into leadership roles, um, network across the profession, both in this SOA and the CAS, and um, really expand their network. And then the last thing we do try and participate in as many industry conferences as possible. Um, we'll attend SOA conferences, CAS conferences, and really try and expand opportunities and leadership through those venues as well. David, I'll and, turn it over to you. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, thanks. Um, yeah, for IABA, it's uh, a little bit similar in terms of structure. Uh, we try to actually put uh, an annual meeting together every year uh, that's well attended. Um, we recently had one in Philadelphia, which uh, had seen about uh, 600 attendees. And this is the occasion for us to be able to talk to students, uh, professionals. Um, you know, we set up a career fairs. Uh, people have like discussions about, you know, 
what their interest is in, in the actual profession. So it's really bringing everybody together in the same venue and exchange ideas and, and have the opportunity to, to, to network. Um, um, on top of that, the IAB also have different, pro, uh, different programs that they actually you know, offer students. Uh, we have an ambassador program for students that are, you know, studying at specific universities. So it's kind of like representing IAB locally at a university level. Uh, there's also an actual bootcamp for students that are looking to, you know, um, you know, for internships or, you know, like full-time positions. So basically helping them navigate that process about like, you know, setting up your resume, going through interview, um, mock interviews and whatnot. Uh, we also have an exam prep program for early uh, exams, I believe P and FM, to be able to you know, provide again that support system for students so that they don't feel overwhelmed by studying by themselves. So they have a community to actually rely on and basically tools and tips to be able to uh, successfully uh, pass those exams. We also have a mentorship program, again, pairing you know, uh, seasoned actuaries with students or even professionals that are probably converting into the actual profession and whatnot, so that you get that you know, uh, exchange of experience um, through those membership uh, programs. And overall, we have for students a scholarship program that's really key um, to advancing education uh, for students uh, from minority backgrounds so that they have the financial support and don't have to basically be uh, overwhelmed. Um, so overall, you know, not sure that's uh, what IBA does. Thank you both so much. For that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jesse. I just wanted to add um, one other thought. Um, of course, David and I work, you know, volunteer in separate organizations, and there's many other organizations out there representing different affinity groups. We also um, collectively do a lot together. So there's a lot of intersectionality between, um, you know, women within the now umbrella, you know, Black actors within AIDA, you know, um, there's a like a LGBTQ group. There's a lot of intersectionality between those, right? And so we, as different affinity groups, will partner on different events and collaborate to just try and support diversity across the um, industry as a whole. Thank you for pointing that out, Jesse. I'm actually trying to go and grab all these uh, websites right now of all the different affinity organizations that we have. So that is what I am dropping into the chat right now for everyone. And I'm happy to go over what all of these are if you if folks don't want to click on the links. Um, but as of now, so why don't we talk about if y'all are intra or if y'all would be willing to talk about your own actuarial journeys and how you got into the profession, as well as how you got connected with your organizations and you know what's really exciting about working with them. David, do you want to start or do you want me to? Uh, I can start actually. How about okay. that? Um, so I am originally from Ivory Coast, West Africa, um, and I went to school, uh, moved to Canada for school. Um, and at the time, I didn't know what I wanted to, you know, be doing, you know, uh, in my professional life. So I was going through the undergrad program in math, and I stumbled across a course about time value of money uh, in life insurance. And I kind of picked my interest about oh, what's that actually? Because it seems to be leveraging mathematical skills to be able to apply in a specific field. Uh, and when I dug deeper, uh, I was able to actually connect the dots and find out that you know, the course was related to an actual uh, profession, uh, which I ended up kind of pursuing uh, in my undergrad. Uh, but at the time, as I was going through my undergrad, I was solely focused on completing my program as an international student, there are certain, um, I would say there are certain um, goals that you have for yourself. So you're kind of trying to focus to make sure that you know you finish your degree and you know so on and so forth. And at the time, I didn't know about the actual exams. So I didn't, that was also important to become an actuary. So I almost graduated within like a year uh, of me graduating and then started to take my exams. So at that point, when I found out about the exams, uh, then I was actually able to connect with other students that were in a similar situation. And that's basically how I stumbled across the IABA. Um, so, you know, kind of networked a little bit about that, um, you know, trying to understand what it did and whatnot. But at the time I wasn't, volunteering with them. I was just, you know, seeking information and whatnot. So I was still doing my exams on my own. And fast forward to um, 2019, I was actually at the time uh, working in Toronto 
And somebody approached me, uh, somebody that was already volunteering for IAB approached me saying, hey, you know, we're interested in um, opening new uh, chapters in Canada because at the time it was mainly in the US. And that's pretty much how I got started uh, being involved with the IBA. So, you know, from there, you know, I became the leader, co-leader, sorry, of the Toronto affiliates. Um, and then uh, a few years ago, I moved to Chicago and ended up being um, the leader of the, the affiliate here as well. So in a nutshell, that's my story. I also came across the profession in undergrad. I entered um, university planning to be a doctor, uh, uh, started chemistry 101 and realized about four days in that I was not cut out to be a doctor. Science just really wasn't for me. Um, I was really more of a math person. Uh, so I was a little aimless for a semester, wasn't sure what to do. And I just met somebody at a restaurant, actually, that was an actuary. And she introduced me to a professor who um, helped me sign up for class. And I just started to go down the road of meeting more people in the profession taking the next class um, within the actuarial program. I did sit for my first exam um, during undergrad and just started to learn that uh, the actuarial concepts, uh, you know, fit my skill set really well. I really enjoyed the combination of math and um, like business intelligence and business problem solving. Um, and so I finished uh, my undergrad with a degree in actuarial science. During um, university, I did have the opportunity to intern with Milliman in a health capacity, and uh, I found out that that fit me perfectly, right? Like, I was always interested in healthcare, but needed to be in a math role, and so being a health actuary ended up being a perfect fit, so I decided to come back to Milliman full-time after I graduated, and that's where I've been ever since. Um, getting through the exams was really, really challenging, but fortunately, I had a lot had a lot of support from like my peers in college, my friends after college and my coworkers. And so by relying on others around me, I was able to finish my exams and get my FSA in 2020, just in time to go out and celebrate with <laughs> nobody due to the shutdown, unfortunately. Um, but since then, I've started a transition to think about giving back to the industry now that I have finished my exams. And that's where I found now I was really looking for some volunteering opportunity within the actuarial profession. And I stumbled across NAWA through a friend right when NAWA was just beginning as an organization. So I've been volunteering there for about uh, um, two years and that's really expanded um, my growth within the actuarial industry and allowed me to, to give back to the next generation of candidates. Thank you both so much. Um, I love hearing these stories of how folks get to the profession because I can truly say I've never heard the same same story twice. It's always by chance. Jesse, I don't think I've heard of anyone meeting someone in a restaurant. So that's really exciting. Thank you for sharing that <laughs> with us. Um, Y'all have talked about a bit of your exam journeys. I know a question that a lot of a lot of first time candidates have is, have you ever failed an exam? I know that's one that folks like to ask a lot. So I will ask that question to you now. Uh, short answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I have definitely failed an exam before um but fortunately a study program allowed me to retake it and and um I learned a lot from the first sitting so even though I failed a sitting it certainly wasn't like a waste of time right that definitely supported me and helped me um pass on the second time I'll probably add that for ASC level exams um and the sooner you actually start taking them, like you'll you'll start developing some skills about, it's not about not passing an exam, it's about what I've learned through that experience and how I can make it better down the road. Um, so obviously, you know, emotionally, you'll feel like, you know, you failed and, you know, it's the end of the world and whatnot, but you've got to actually, obviously, you know, take a few days maybe to digest that and take a step back and look at it objectively for the next time, right? To make sure that you are, um, you know, setting up the right, um, you know, steps to be able to be successful, so. And it does, I think, feel um, like a long time um, to sit for another sitting, whatever, it's three months away, six months away. 
I like when I failed, I was like, oh my gosh, that's six whole months of my life. That's terrible. Like I have to wait a whole nother six months to pass um, or even a year or whatever it was. But in the long run, it's completely worth it, right? Like over the course of your entire career, that six month wait isn't going to feel as as dramatic as it did in the moment. So I encourage you all, you know, if you are in that position of having failed an exam or when, if you do fail an exam, don't get discouraged and just recognize in the long run, it'll be worth it. I also don't know that I've ever met an actuary that passed every exam on the same time. I think we've all been there at one point or another. <laughs> Thank you both so much uh, for sharing that. We have a question. Um, can y'all talk about talk more about how you chose to pursue your track, life, health, et cetera. And are you staying or changing that at some point? You want to go for it, Jason? Sure. Um, we might have a one-side re response for both health, health actuaries here, um, but I have interned other places. So um, I was um, drawn to health for a couple of reasons. One, as I mentioned, I wanted to be in the health field, really thought I could be a doctor. Um, and so health actuary, like as it kind of allowed me to get close to the patient and try and influence healthcare in this country, um, but still use my math skills and avoid chemistry at all costs. Um, I also appreciate the more fast paced nature of health. I interned in life, which was like very interesting mathematically, um, but it was a little bit, little bit longer to see the results of any analysis. But in health, it's typically like max one year before you're seeing the results of the work that you're doing. And so I really appreciated that you know, fast changing environment, fast feedback loop. And I just found that to be more interesting. Uh, for me, it's again about curiosity. So the university I attended, um, you know, gave uh, classes about, you know, pension, general insurance, but not health, which for me, I found interesting because when I was looking up on the ISO website, I was clearly seeing that it was a health track. So I was right away, you know, curious about it. So once I graduated, I started seeking roles in the health space, not knowing exactly what that meant. So in Canada, it's a little bit different. The healthcare system is a little bit different. So what I ended up doing was starting off as an underwriting analyst understanding the foundations of like, you know, pricing and, and whatnot in the health space. And then later on moving, moving to the, like the consulting, um, actual consulting uh, experience. So, and I don't foresee myself changing fields, but you know, you never know in life. <laughs> so. I agree. I don't either. There's uh, too much going on in the U.S. healthcare system yeah. right now, I think, <laughs> to, for me to um, move away from it. I would encourage anyone earlier in their career, though, to try and like get a diverse perspective, especially if you are looking for that first full time job, um, job shadows, talking to your peers, talking to professors, you know, things like this, whatever you can do to just get different exposure to different fields, I think will help um, help you identify what is the best fit for you. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you. Thank you both so much. We have a question here. Um, can you kindly expound upon risk management path in relation to actuarial science and what papers should they do to be a risk manager? Hmm. I know there is a corporate risk track. Um I'm sure, so that one would definitely be one way to do it. Um, the other way would definitely be to be like networking with people in that space. Cause I know we have an enterprise risk management uh, track that can, you know, be um, helpful there. But I don't know, Jesse, if you have any like um, knowledge on that as well. Yeah, I agree on your thought with the, the exam, the like enterprise risk management exam, because if I recall correctly, that's voluntary. So definitely uh, consider that one if you are interested in risk management. The other thought I'd have is to, if you're looking for like internships, jobs, job shadows, whatever it is, um, consider focusing on like the larger companies that are going to have both actual science and like an enterprise risk management function under the same umbrella, because that'll probably give you exposure and like flexibility to, to try both. Um, certainly there are organizations out there that are just going to focus on one versus the other. Um, so you might be a little um, fixated on one if you, if you, you know, work for those companies, but 
there's a lot of organizations out there that do both and have those departments more integrated. Thank you. Um, I'm curious to hear about uh, going back a bit to the topic and working with your organizations. Have y'all interacted with students or candidates as they're on their journey? And are there questions that those students or candidates tend to ask as they're seeking, you know, mentors or just help through the pathway? Sorry, to clarify, you're looking for, you're asking about questions that we've answered for other candidates in the yes. past. Yes. Oh, okay. Thanks for clarifying. Of course. One question I get a lot is what our day-to-day -day looks like and maybe how that's evolved over time. Um, so I could go into detail on that if that's helpful. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Sounds good. Um, so uh, commonly getting your first actuarial job um, during exams, right after exams, et cetera, um, right after college, um, or you know, if you're a career changer, first actuarial job commonly looks like more technically oriented, right? M my first few years at Milliman, I was very deep in the weeds. I spent a lot of time in Excel. I spent some time doing some programming. Um, but even at the beginning, there was always an emphasis on like communication, right? Like I've never really worked in a silo. I've always worked with at least a few other people on my team. Um, and that's the part that becomes more important as you progress throughout your career. Um, so as I progress, I've become, you know, less focused on the technical work and spend a lot more time in meetings, spend a lot more time communicating with others. Um, and more focused on like the results and understanding the implications of the results. Um, that said, I do think there's a lot of room for actuaries to control what they want to do in their career. There's so many job openings out there right now, particularly in the health field. And so to the extent you can identify like what you like to do, like, do you like modeling and doing Excel work? Do you want to talk to people all day, try and find jobs that suit your skill set and, um, or or even within a job, try and find opportunities that suit your skill set. So, um, you know, I described kind of what my path is and what a common path is um, in terms of day to day, but encourage everyone to try and um, tailor their day to day to, to match their own skill set because there is a lot of variety within the actual profession. I'll probably add a couple of thoughts on that. Um, one is if you are um, a student, I would encourage you to be able to maximize the number of exams you can complete before you graduate. Because once you get into the active life, the work life, it's it could be a little bit challenging sometimes. So actually balance work and exam and also personal life. Um, the other thing is, um, as you are entering the actual profession, it's really key to understand that you have every, every right sorry, to ask questions to fail as much as many times as you can, because that's really where you're going to set up your foundation for the next step in your career, right? Making sure that you're asking, networking, as we said earlier, asking questions and stuff, so that you know by the time you actually start maturing in that in that in the profession, you have a well-rounded view of what it's like to be an actuary. So thank you so much. And y'all have mentioned networking a few times. So I went ahead and dropped the link. Um for networking opportunities that are specific for candidates. Um, so if y'all, even if you haven't taken an exam yet, you can still come to these. I know that the one we have coming up next is next Monday in New York City. So if folks are not local to New York City, this might not be a great one for you to attend, but we also have upcoming Candidate Connect events in Toronto and in um the DC area. I can't remember exactly where impact is this year, but it's somewhere in the DC area. So if anyone on the call lives in those areas, that's a very low cost way. It's either 20 or $30 to attend the uh, meeting as a candidate. And I really encourage folks to sign up for that. Right. And on that note, we have another uh, question. Can you talk a bit about working at your company, meaning as you job search, uh, if it was based on in your internship, I know that Jess, you touched on that a little bit, the type of work, consulting or none, et cetera. David, do you want to take this one first? 
Sure. Yeah, I can. Uh, for me, it was a little bit different because coming from Canada, again, Can Canadian, the Canadian and the U.S. healthcare system are two, two different uh, systems. Uh, so for me, I was seeking more opportunities to grow within my career. So I had already done underwriting. I'd done actual consulting. And by that, I mean um, on the health side. So I did group benefits renewals. So anything, you know, life, LTD, health, you know, renewal rate, if you will. And also on the other side, I was also doing um, actual evaluation. So post-retirement medical, post-improvement uh, um, benefits uh, valuations. Uh, so for me, at that point, I think I had explored as much as I could of the Canadian side. So I was, again, interested in um, seeking opportunities on the U.S. side and, and, you know, find ways to actually still be in the field, but also keep uh, expanding on my, on my experience, which I ended up finding with my current employer, where now, um, instead of being on the client side, I'm on, on the other side, which is the auditor side. So now I'm actually auditing, you know, like the results that, you know, clients are actually putting out there. Um, I'm also helping with, you know, reserving, uh, disability income work, group benefits in general. So these type of things are still connected, but obviously, you know, it's an, it's an add-on to my, to my experience. And also what, what I find interesting about it is that getting that experience helps me understand what the exams, the FSA exams are about, right? Because that, that's really key to actually be able to uh, be successful in those uh, as well, so. Just curious, David, because I want to touch on this too, but why did you choose consulting? Very interesting. It just came to me. Okay, perfect. And ever since it came to me, I've, I've, you know, I've been in consulting. So, <laughs> some and and actually, you bring up a good point because there's this talk about uh, people thinking about insurance companies versus consulting companies, and most times it's about uh, what is the balance, like which would be best for me to be able to take my exams. Generally speaking, and just let me know if you if you think otherwise, like insurance companies would have. A slightly more better work-life balance for you to be able to take those exams versus consulting that's more like you know like you know intensive in a way but you can still it's not impossible it's just a little bit more work but you can still be able to um to pass those exams so um and obviously you have access to um the exam support program actual exam support program getting days or depending on you know, obviously on, on companies getting the you know your exams paid for 30 days materials and so on and so forth so yeah. agreed and to expand on like the insurance versus consulting conversation a bit particularly in the context of exams i found so i've been full-time in a consult or like full time, I've been always in consulting. I did intern at an insurance company, but I've always been full time in consulting. And what I found with the exam progress compared to my peers in an insurance company is we could both get the same amount of study hours and work life balance that we wanted. But at the consulting company, I had to like push for it myself a little bit more. My friends at insurance companies, like nobody would talk to them before noon because they're studying and like. I don't think anyone would notice, to be honest, if I wasn't taking study hours at Milliman. But if I said I was studying, everyone would leave me alone. So I think it is very possible to be at a consulting company, pass your exams, and have work-life balance. It's just going to take a little more communication, a little more independence, and a little more boundary setting than um, an insurance company would. Um, I actually chose consulting early in my career because I liked the variety I was getting, right? Like at an insurance company, better work-life balance or like easier to get work-life balance, I think. But I found that people would often get put in one role for like a full year and that's all they do. And early in my career, I wanted to get a little more variety, a little more exposure to different aspects of the healthcare industry. And that's a lot easier to do in consulting, at least from what I've seen. Um, so I can work on multiple projects even in a week that cover different aspects of the healthcare um, organization or healthcare industry rather and that's allowed me to learn a lot more um, have a lot broader experience and then ultimately as I've like narrowed and specialized more I'm confident that I like what I do because I've seen so many different things so I'll um, throughout the um, maybe unpopular argument that consulting actually is great early in your career because you're just going to see so many different things um, 
I, uh, to answer the question in the chat, I largely just stumbled across it. Um, because of my internship, uh, Milliman did visit the campus where I was attending school, but um, I was drawn to it just because it was the best fit of all the different companies that I had exposure to. And to be honest, they just offered me a job. <laughs> so that was a big part of it too. Um, that's all I have to Thank say on that you. question. Yeah. Thank you so much. And David had mentioned the actuarial exam support program. So I dropped that link in the chat. That is um, a support program that offers reimbursements to students who are taking exams. So definitely look into that because that is a huge help for a lot of folks I know. We've got another question here. Uh, you both have talked about this, but can you expand on the importance of volunteering within the field and how it's possible to balance that with everything else? work-wise and personal-wise? Um, I can probably take that. Um, for me, I really think about it as an act of service. Um, and I, like Jess alluded to earlier, you've received from you know so many people, at some point you have to think about giving back, right? So for me, it's really, it comes down to act of service. Um, and again, as I was saying earlier about uh, being part of the founding of the new chapters in Canada, that brought me, like, I basically saw a different perspective on how I could be helpful in that, talking to students, um, you know, because like sometimes you have questions or you're like you're worrying about something and you need people to be able to expand on that, like, hey, you know, you don't have to stress about this, like, this is easy or like, this is how you can navigate this and stuff like that. So from there, I was just kind of drawn to that. And I've, I've, I tried, you know, obviously every day to make sure that whoever I'm interacting with, I'm, you know, sharing, you know, my experience, my knowledge, and however I can be of help, um, I just offer it up, so. Agree 100%. That was like um, the first thing that drew me to volunteering. Again, past my exams, like I should really give back. I've had so much support, so um found a volunteering opportunity to you know do that active service like David mentioned all on top of that clarify I was surprised by how much I got back from volunteering I had really only been a milliman um since graduating and volunteering within the actual industry allowed me to get out of the milliman bubble really meet other people um see how other people were like problem solving and working through things because that was quite a bit different than what I'd seen at Milliman. And this has been a great opportunity for me just to like learn new skills um, that I apply to my job too. You know, I've had opportunity to present. I've had opportunity to take more leadership roles at NOAA than I would at Milliman. Um, and mostly just been inspired by a lot of impressive leaders in the field like David and others within NOAA. I feel like everyone I've met through volunteering um, have been really great people to learn from. So great opportunity to get back. And I have been, you know, surprised and impressed by how much I've, I've learned from it as well. Thank you so much for those really thoughtful answers. I really appreciate that because I think the volunteering piece is not something that we talk about a lot. And it's probably not something that's at the forefront of candidates' minds. So mm -hmm. Jesse, especially, I really appreciate you sharing about the support that you received and then wanting to give that support to others. That I just love that a lot. So thank you so much. That was very heartwarming. <laughs> um, we've got another question in here. Could you give some examples on what types of of problems consulting actuaries work on are your clients businesses or individuals i can start on that one um so i'll give a little background on like where i focus my i'm specialized basically um, in what we call value-based care so i support hospitals and physicians directly um with this movement to value-based care and what that means is we're trying to incentivize lower cost of healthcare, higher quality of healthcare. So most of our problems are focused on like, how do we structure incentives so we can lower costs and improve quality of healthcare? If you haven't heard, it's not super stellar at the moment in this country. Um, so trying to solve that like more macro problem. Um, in terms of day to day, a lot of the work that we get is maybe the trickier or thornier problems. A lot of times our clients will keep the e easier problems in house. Um, and they'll typically ask consultants to do some of the more challenging. And I think some of the more in 
interesting questions. So a lot of times we're running across questions that like have never been answered before and no one's really thought about it. And it's, um, you know, it's hard, but I think it's um, been a great opportunity um, to problem solve creatively and really push the boundaries of what actuaries can do in the, this industry. Uh, for me, I, as I said, my background is in employee group benefits. So what I will do uh, for some, some of our clients is basically helping them uh, in terms of determining the premium contributions that employees have to pay. So it has to go through different set of analysis, you know, looking at claims data, you know, um, enrollment and whatnot. Um, there's also a big aspect on, on reserving. So um, if you think about it, it's like uh, from the time, like a claim is, you know, um, put through the system until the time it's actually paid out, there's kind of like a lag. And really what we help clients with is basically estimating the amount of money you have to, to have in the bank for that you know, amount of time once the claims comes to you to be able to be paid. So that's a reserving part of it. Uh, in terms of disability work is really understanding what is the risk exposure for companies uh, that they have for uh, current employees that are absent from work, right? So it comes at a cost, obviously, they pay for the premium, they pay for the benefit, but essentially the, the companies are trying to understand how much money I should be able to set aside for those people that are actually out of um, out of work at the moment, um, and then from the audit side, uh, look at you know the uh, actuarial uh, assumptions, uh, making sure that you know they really fall in line with the actual guidelines um, and whatnot. So we serve um, a variety of clients. Um, I mostly work with um, insurance companies or health plans, but really is is spans across you know, public and private entities overall, so. Thank you so much for answering that question. We have another one um, that I'm excited to hear answers to. Can you share a bit more of the soft skills and leadership skills learned as an actuary and as a volunteer in the field? Wanna take that? Um, sure, yeah, I can start with that. Um, I'd say the big one, is um, maybe three big ones. Communication is a big one. Um, learning how to lead and make decisions for a group is the second one I've learned in particular with NAWA. And then the third one is being comfortable, being uncomfortable, right? Like getting out of that comfort zone. Um, so to start on communication, that's I think one of the most important skills as an actuary, even on day one of your career. I'm sure everyone's heard that a lot, um, but I can't stress it enough. You know, we do all these analysis and work really hard on the technical skills, but at the end of the day, we have to explain it to others um, and to be able to communicate that clearly. So I've learned that through Milliman, certainly, um, but I've learned that through now, especially because I'm working with a lot of people who, you know, I don't see them every day or they came up through a different industry. So we think very differently and it's really pushed the boundaries on like how I communicate with others um, who, you know, we haven't worked together every day for 10 years. Um, the second one is leadership, um, in now what, and I think this, David, let me know if you disagree. I think this is common in affinity groups where there is a lot of opportunity within these groups. It feels like there's endless work that we could be doing. It's just a matter of who is willing to dedicate the time. So if people are willing to dedicate the time to volunteering for these groups, there's endless opportunity to be stepping up, taking leadership leadership, running with initiatives. And um, I was willing to do that. And it's really pushed um, my skills on making decisions, leading a group, leading an initiative. Um, I haven't really had that much opportunity within um, Milliman. And then last is just stepping outside my comfort zone. Um, as I mentioned, I joined NAWA when it's very early. Um, we've come a long way, but in the early stages, of course, we are brand new. A lot was unorganized. A lot was just like, who's ever willing to take the initiative? Just just do that. <laughs> and um, So it was a lot of thinking on our feet um, and, and trying to, to do things that we didn't know were going to work. Um, so those are all skills that I learned from both now and Milliman and have been helpful in everything that I do in my job. Um, I couldn't have given a better answer than that, but I, I would have <laughs> been on a couple of things. So for the, from the leadership yeah. standpoint, I would... Um, I would say fostering an inclusive environment is really critical, uh, especially when you're working with junior uh, junior staff, because uh, they're really looking up to you and they're trying to 
do their best to deliver on the, on the work. Uh, but if they don't feel valued and empowered to actually ask questions, you know, it, it's not going to go well for the experience. So really making sure that you are looking after them, you know, kind of seeking opportunities to make sure that they have that, you know, uh, time to, to grow really within the role is really key. Um, but overall, you know, uh, in my experience, what I've learned about, about leadership is like, you know, trying to make sure that you know um, your stakeholders, obviously junior staff or you know, senior, senior leadership, and trying to be kind of like that, you know, team player or like project manager to be able to, you know, like deliver you know, across the board, right? Like looking up for, for, the, uh, for the, um, the junior staff and also making sure that you are meeting expectations uh, from the leadership. Um, the other thing I would say is um, like making sure that you are um, finding ways to give back, as I said earlier. So it, like it means, for example, if it means, for example, um, taking the time to explain like how an Excel model, for example, works. So sometimes like, and like I'm sure uh, Jesse would agree with that, we have sometimes models that are complex and it's like, you're getting in there, it's like, you don't know how you navigate and stuff. And you have like a 30 minute call and that's it, you go and like wander in the, in the model and stuff like that. So it's really sometimes trying to like, pick the, you know, like what are the red flags? Like, like is somebody really spinning their wheels and stuff like that and like offer up, offer up help. Um, and the other thing I would say about volunteering as well is there are no set rules or structures. Obviously, there are guiding, guiding you know, principles for, for those associations, don't get me wrong. But once you start volunteering, you would find that you are empowered to do what you think is best for the association. Right, so they they're giving you mandate, and you actually go and execute on that. So think about that as well, because sometimes we we tend to think about it as like it's another you know another job that I'm actually doing, like in a way it's a job, but you really trying to drive impact in the actual profession, and it comes down to like what you think is best to be able to move the association forward in the way that you know they're like that will be in fact impactful for for others. So. Thank you so much um, for those answers. And David, you brought up something, the sense of belonging is something I really wanted to get to in this uh, in this uh, webinar right now. Um, so I'm wondering, this is more of a personal question for me as well. I'm really interested in like employee resource groups and affinity groups and things like that. So could y'all talk about that sense of belonging that if, if I don't want to put feelings on anyone, but if you feel that sense of belonging within your organizations, what that does for you, and if that helps you stay connected to the work that you're doing, and if it actually helps your work um, being involved in something like uh, one of your organizations. Do you want to go for it, Jesse? Or... Yeah, yeah, I can start. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do feel like I belong in my organization. I think Milliman does a fantastic job of not only like talking about DEI, but like fostering that within every team. And like, like David said, I think we have a lot of good leaders who focus on um, being an inclusive leader, which is different, I think, than just being a leader. Um, so I felt that certainly in my company, I have intentionally gravitated towards like departments and leaders who I think excel in that space. And that's helped me as well. And I 100% agree that belonging is going to accelerate your career because you're going to be able to focus on the job itself and you're not going to have to worry about feeling excluded um, or all the other <laughs> emotional baggage that goes along with it um, so I if anyone you know is struggling with that I'd encourage you to maybe identify people even if it's like adjacent to your current role who are fostering an inclusive environment and try and like either bring them in as a mentor meet with them, maybe even try and find a job on their team, et cetera, and just try and like move to a spot where you do feel like you belong. Um, I do also feel like I belong uh, at my current employer. They they really amazed me by the, the quality of programs that they have, you know, internally. Uh, so DI programs uh, specifically, they, you know, run, you know, regularly like webinars to actually remind people of like, you know, certain things like in contrast bias, for example, for example, right? Um, the other thing too is um, 
uh, as you volunteer for an external association, it kind of gives you that leeway of like, obviously, if you have somebody, as Jesse said, that you look up to within the company to be able to talk about certain things, that's great. But also that's really where, you know, having an extended network outside of work would be helpful. So you could have like a mentor or, you know, an advocate that you can actually talk to about certain things that could be more personal and that way have, you know, some insights about how to resolve the issue or how to go about, you know, finding a solution, right? Um, so really, it's really key, obviously, to actually, that's what I'm, the point that I'm trying to drive is, is really key to um, volunteering for uh, associations um, outside of, you know, um, your, your organization, so. And I, do you mind, Brian, if I just expand on that, or I actually want to just talk about like maybe a time that I didn't feel like I belonged um, and how I addressed it. So within Milliman, everything's been great. And with most of my clients, I have no concerns, but occasionally it, there's a challenging dynamic where I'm a 30 year old woman advising in a lot of cases, like 50 plus year old men who have been in the industry for a long time. Um, and that I think a lot of it's self-imposed, right? But there, there is a dynamic where I feel like I don't like belong. Or I do feel like I need to step back a little bit because I'm a very young <laughs> female. Um, and I, so I don't know that that challenge will ever go away completely, but I've been very fortunate. And what's helped me through that the most is um, like David and I kind of alluded to is having people in my camp being willing to like stand by me and say, Jesse is qualified to be an advisor here. This client needs to listen to you or, you know, you and like encourage me to not be afraid to be in that role, even though it can feel intimidating. Um, and I feel like I have to worry about my gender or my age. So um, all to say, you know, even though I think David and I have had great success belonging and there's so many places in the actual field where I feel like everyone can belong, there are still challenges and I'm sure everyone's going to cross that at some point. But if you have that foundation and the mentor, like, you know, David said, maybe through an affinity org, maybe through your own company, whatever it is, if you have those mentorship and championship relationships set up, that'll help you get through it. Thank you both so much for sharing. This is, again, something obviously personally that I think is super important and it's in all fields, not just the actuarial profession. So folks, even if you don't end up becoming an actuary, you'll have this in any field that you go into. So I really appreciate y'all being open and talking about that. Um, have another question that is changing the trajectory of the conversation again, but that's okay. Are there any tips for a career changer who missed the chance to, the chance to get an internship and is struggling to get into the industry? Okay, I yeah, sorry. Yeah. I can take that one. I I don't think it's ever too late to actually get into the actual profession. Obviously, depending on the goals that you have set uh, for yourself. Me personally, I've never interned uh, when I was actually doing my undergrad, so that was a challenge for me to be able to find and um, like a position in the actual field. Uh, but by really like striving, you know, using my curiosity, like being, you know, driven and whatnot, I was able to actually navigate through, you know, getting that underwriting experience before jumping back into the, the actual profession. And what was key, actually, I should probably expand on that. What was key during my experience as an underwriting analyst is that that company wasn't supporting me for exams. So I was self-driven enough to keep writing my exams while, you know, getting my first experience in the field. And that was actually a key point for me to get into the actual, the actual profession, uh, the actual consulting experience that I had uh, after that, because I was basically able to demonstrate that while I was learning the foundations of healthcare, I was able to actually follow my goals and still, you know, keep writing my exam. So my, my employer at the time was actually really pleased to hear that. So you have to have like self, you know, motivation and um, to be able to actually um, get in that. So I wouldn't say, you know, don't be discouraged by the fact that you are not able to get into the industry. It's just take a step back and think about maybe the way you are actually trying to get into the field is not the right way. There's a better way. So you have to like take a step back and kind of think about your options. And obviously, as we said, like, you know, talking to other people in the field that have gone probably through similar uh, paths to be able to actually, you know, share, like shed some light on, uh, on some, some of those uh, situ uh, solutions for you. So. Agree with everything you said, David. I just have two more things to add. One, um, I don't know if you've looked for internships already. I, I don't know. Like, there are 
there are internships out there for career changes, right? My internship at Milliman, I was working alongside of someone who was like a chemistry PhD. So um, if you're not already, I consider seeking out internships um, that are open to career changers. Um, and then the only other thing I'll add, David alluded to this a bit already with his underwriting story. Um, you've learned, you know, in your previous career or anyone in a previous career has learned tons of skills that are relevant to an actuarial job, even if it's not like, you know, the math on exam FM or whatever it is. Um, there's plenty of skills that you've learned that'll help you transfer careers. And so I'd encourage you to like reflect and think about what those are and then highlight those in an interview or a job shadow or whatever it is. I'd much rather have somebody who is driven, can communicate, is resilient than someone who's doesn't have those skills, but has passed like 84 exams, you know? And so like identifying what those soft skills are, what those work ethic skills are and leaning on those, I think will help you um, maybe get a gain an edge in an interview or whatever it is. Yeah, I 100% agree with that, having those soft skills too, so. Thank you. I'm trying to find the link to the SOA's job board and I'm having a difficult time finding it. So I'm going to keep looking um, at that. We don't have any other questions and we are close to our time. So David and Jesse, I would like to, if there's anything you were expecting to be asked, but you weren't, or if there's any other final words for lack of a better way to call it for this, that'd be great if you wanted to share those. Um. I can probably say a couple of things about IABA. I, I would encourage you to, you know, uh, check out IABA. Uh, as I said earlier, it's it's really a great organization to be part of. And you don't have to be of, you know, black, you know, black or, you know, a minority group to be able to uh, volunteer. You can also be an ally. So talk about, you know, for example, the mentorship program that I, that I was talking about earlier. Uh, these are ways to actually be able to connect people that are, you know, really, you know, um, following the mission uh, of IABA in, in, the, in that regard. Um, so the other thing too is, you know, don't like keep, like believe in yourself. Um, obviously there is, you know, everybody goes through different phases in their life, but being an actuary is not an impossible thing. I, at one point I was thinking that it was, it was just, you know, ludicrous for me to think that I, you know, I could be an actuary, but it's really about, you know, the relationships that you develop along the way to help you. And it's the same in life, right? Like, you know, you have friendships that you develop uh, along the way that help you grow as a person. So it's the same thing as uh, for, for the actual profession, trying to make sure that you seek those, you know, uh, connections or opportunities to be able to, uh, to get into the actual field and be successful, so. I'll just add two things, or I'll have one thing and then I'll um, kind of close up by talking about now in a little bit more detail. Um, so I, I think the entry to actual profession is challenging, right? Like we have to do, do all these exams on top of college. It requires a lot of independence, a lot of self-study um, in a ways that maybe some of our peers in other industries don't have to deal with. Um, and then on top of that, finding internship, maybe changing careers, whatnot, there is a lot going on. Um, I'll encourage anyone who's struggling or maybe worried about finishing the exams or entering the career to just um, be resilient, stick with it. Every actuary I know has had some obstacles and some challenges, but everyone, I think, found that it was worth it at the end. So you're not alone, certainly, if you are challenging, challenged or having doubts, um, but I really, really encourage you to stick with it keep fighting. As David mentioned earlier, maybe think of a different way to approach it, a different mentor, a different network, whatnot. Um, and I'll 100% echo David's thought that all the affinity orgs are great opportunities to either expand your network or to enter into the profession. Um, inclusive to all, all and um, there's a lot of opportunities to meet people and maybe find other jobs or internships or whatnot. Um, to speak on NAWA, I will um, echo David's thought that it's not only women um, in NAWA. It, you know, the title is Network of Actual Women and Allies. We certainly have a lot of diversity within our organization. Really, it includes anybody who's interested in like supporting um, women in the actual profession. So um, the PDF that Brandon put out earlier has like a link to um, membership or volunteering. If you're interested, I encourage you to check that out. And then one last plug, we do have a mentorship program. 
um, with a deadline to sign up in two days. So if you're interested, <laughs> sorry for the last minute notice. If you're interested or just want somebody, um, want some additional support in the industry, I encourage you to check that out as well. It's um, free. Membership and the mentorship program are both free. Um, but otherwise, thank you for having me today. It's been really great to talk to everyone. Thank you both so much. I really appreciate you taking this time to chat with us today and to answer these questions. Um, thank you everyone for attending. The recording of this should be up in the next few days if you want to review it. And thank you again. I really appreciate your time and I will talk to everyone later. Bye everyone. Thank you, thank you all. That's pretty good.